Ladies and gentlemen, we are ready to begin the panel discussion. I just wanted to first say a few words of introduction uh, about a very good friend and a loyal supporter of the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy for many years, uh, the Honorable Dirk Niebel. Uh, Dirk Niebel has had a very impressive career politically uh, throughout a number of different levels. Most famous, I think, is your time serving as the Minister for Economic Development for Germany, uh, where I think you made some very valuable uh, contributions, strengthening the bridges between Germany and, I think, every continent of the world. Uh, so Germany is grateful to you for that. Uh, the Institute for Culture Diplomacy is very grateful to you for the many contributions you've given us as the Institute. Uh, we had an excellent conference, actually many in Berlin, uh, also in Montenegro, I still remember, where you helped to co-chair an excellent event together with the President of the Supreme Court of Montenegro and a very distinguished uh, group of uh, uh, individuals, including the President, as well as other heads of state. So, Mr. Niebel, we're very grateful to have you back again uh, at our annual conference, also for your assistance today at the Advisory Board uh, meeting. And maybe we could first give a warm welcome to the Honorable Dirk Niebel. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for the introduction. Um, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, I know that this panel is the last point between you and the Buffett. <laughs> and uh, I know that we are um, short in time. Uh, so I will start with two new panelists uh, on the stage. On your right hand side, uh, we have a famous uh, journalist from Catalonia, Josep Cuny. And nearly on the left-hand side from you. Uh, we have a new panelist, Helge Magnus Gunnarsson. He is the Deputy Director of Public Prosecution of Iceland. All the other three guys, the politicians, uh, you have seen already today. And they also um, mentioned uh, something about the situation between Catalonia and Spain. And for me, that is the reason to start with somebody who didn't say anything today. Um, and I would ask Mr. Gunnarsson, because <clears throat> I'm not quite sure if we have alternative facts. Um, alternative facts are not fake news. Uh, <laughs> it, it can be a different view of a situation. Um, we heard that um, some former politicians which have been caught abroad of Spain in European countries um, should come back home. And uh, the extradition um, was not so easy every time. As far as I remember, when Mr. Puigdemont was caught in Germany, German uh, courts had to decide if, um, what, if, if the reason to be brought back to Spain is also punished in Germany or not. And I would like to, say, uh, to hear from Mr. Gunnarsson, is there a, a common European law? How does it work if European countries, which are partner, um, try to um, solve a situation like this? Yes, thank you. Uh, this is um, Do you hear me? No. No. Sorry. Maybe you can open all the mics so we can discuss together. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there is a convention uh, within the Council of Europe from 1957 on. Uh, it's called the Eurovision Conve European Convention on Extradition. Uh, and uh, in the second paragraph, the article of that uh, convention, there is, uh, and I, I'm sure Spain and Germany is part of that convention through the Council of Europe. And the, the second article demands that the, the crime must be a punishable in the both the requesting and the requested country. So uh, I have not seen this ruling of this court, mm -hmm. so I can't really talk about that. But in general, as in my country, we would never extradite person for something that was not criminalized in Icelandic penal code. So uh, that's probably, as I see it, the reason why he was not extradited. Um, would re rebellion be punishing, uh, punish, uh, would the punishment? Be, would there be a punishment for rebellion in Iceland? Yeah, rebellion and not rebellion. Uh, the court of uh, the requested country would have to evaluate uh, the merit of the case. Is it really <coughs> rebellion, rebellion or or not? According to their then uh, German law, uh, they can be uh, different uh, way of describing the alleged crime in different countries. So even though it is punishable in Germany, it can be worded in a different way, so, or, or the fact of the case uh, doesn't 
uh, fill up the crit criteria for uh, to be criminalized. And this is a vital element in uh, criminal law that it has to be clear whether it is criminal or not. So thank you. I, I learned that it's a case of definition. Yeah. And um, for this, <coughs> um, as you mentioned uh, in your speech, Mr. Cooney, uh, what's the obligation of the medias to make sure that everybody starts a discussion to find a solution for a problem uh, with the same facts? It's um, so difficult to, to answer this question. I, I listened to Mr. Bauza and Mr. Mas a few minutes ago, and I thought the episodes, the conclusion, my conclusion, I think is very simple. The episodes of the recent past have been so hard that to find a solution in a short term, it will be very, very, very difficult. Everybody explain a lot of pages of the past. Nobody explain nothing about the future. Mm -hmm. And everybody are prisoner of the present. That's my literal conclusion as a journalist. That sounds a little bit frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> um, to describe the conflict in a nutshell, I think it's, uh, it's territor territorial integrity versus independence. And uh, both are values which are uh, very valuable for mm -hmm. both sides. That's the reason why uh, Kosovo is not accepted as a country from several uh, countries in the European Union, because, because more countries have a Catalonia than only Spain, uh, but it's named otherwise. So, um, Mr. Crown, you described the situation in the um, Northern Ireland, Ireland, UK conflict. And we remember, I remember when I've been a child, and now I'm 55 years old, uh, the conflict was in our medias every day, in our uh, living rooms, and somebody must, find, must have found the right vehicle to get trust to start negotiations. Could cultural diplomacy can be a part of trust building, a trust building concept? Yes, I mean, all contact is, is valuable, particularly when there's an, an impasse or when people feel we're in a cul-de-sac. Um, without dialogue, no progress can be made. If there's no progress made, the positions harden on both sides. It's like what's happening with what Russia has been doing recently with Ukraine. You create facts on the ground. And, um, if there isn't an international political will to do something about it, those facts on the ground will remain. Uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is the same problem. Facts are being created on the ground which are at variance with international law, uh, but um, when it comes to the table, they try to use the new facts on the ground as being the reality you have to deal with. So, I was just making the point that for us in Ireland, it's, it's, you needed two politicians like Albert Reynolds, who was the Prime Minister of Ireland at the time, and John Major, who was the Prime Minister of, or was Prime Minister of Great Britain, who had got to meet as finance ministers, meeting at the European Finance Council every month, where they built up a great rapport and they got to trust each other, got to know each other. And the European Union was a great place for Ireland and Britain to talk about these things as, as equals, away from the conflict, away from the media. And eventually, you know, you had this conflict where, where we lost 4,000 people. People were killed over a 30-year period. Uh, and eventually, Albert Reynolds was able to ask a very simple question, who's afraid of peace? Because if you can get into a, a violent situation where everyone is tit for tat, divides society, creates grievance, creates a lot of suffering, a lot of people who harden their position because they've lost their family, they've lost friends, they've lost sons and daughters in this conflict. You have to find people who, who ask the simple question. The ordinary people, I think, would like to see a resolution to the problem. You know, living in a crisis is not a very pleasant place to be when you're trying to rear a family and live a normal life. 
and the responsibility of politicians is to find a way forward. And I'm sure there are, you know, I don't question the legal, no, there are legal issues here that um, I'm a lawyer myself. Lawyers are not great at bringing clarity to situations. <laughs> they get paid for fomenting confusion. <laughs> Highly paid. <laughs> um, politicians engage, hopefully, in constructive ambiguity. And the reason why they engage in constructive ambiguity is they need to find some space where none seems to exist. And so therefore, unless people come to the, come to the table with that approach, it seems to me, um, and I'm not an expert in this, and I don't wish to be, I'm not making any criticism of anybody, please understand. <coughs> But go back to the point where it seemed to me 2010, you, you have a devolved administration. You have an agreement between the central government and the regional government as to how things are to proceed. And then the court gets involved and upsets that political agreement, the constitutional court. I'm sure they thought in their wisdom it was a good idea. I'm not so sure now if they know what they know now. If they went back in 2010, would they come to the same decision? Because uh, far from solving the problem, it, uh, it, it exacerbates the problem. So my view when you get to a situation like this is <coughs> try and go back to the point where the split hadn't happened or the, the big schism hadn't occurred in people's minds. Say, so let's go back to 2010. Are there elements of that that can be recreated, that can meet the constitutional problem, whatever it was? Is there now a different constitution? Is there now a different number of personages in that court that would come to a different position, knowing what they know now? Um, the job is to unwind back to a position where you can proceed again, mm -hmm. and it seems to me that measures and countermeasures that are being taken on both sides. Uh, both sides, of course, think they're right, but uh, the measures and countermeasures have now left us in a, where, where, where the room for the maneuver is narrowing and <coughs> narrowing and narrowing all the time. So uh, I think there's, people should go back and analyze that situation from 2000, at 2010. If you could find some common agreement at that point, as I was saying before, you know, people have aspirations. One has an aspiration for independence. The other has an aspiration to maintain the unity of the state with a devolved, a devolved concept involved. Those are legitimate. These can be seen as legitimate political positions. It doesn't mean that you achieve them. It doesn't mean that uh, you decide that when we enter ne negotiations, it must end up here or it must end up there. If you do that, you don't have a negotiation. You actually have a pretty fake format. <coughs> okay. So if you want to go back, what we had to do was, you know, I could continue with uh, making the argument about how the Northern Ireland was formed and why it was a totally artificial entity, but it's of no, it's a, you know, it's three generations ago. My grandfather fought that battle years ago. He's dead now. He died 60 years ago. He may he rest in peace. My job is not to fight his battle. My job is to find a way forward for my generation going forward. Thank you. And I think that's where people need to get to. You need to use, as the journalist was saying, how do we build from the present a future that's better than what's, what it's looking like at the moment? Thank you very much. Mr. Rahman, is it possible to think in the direction coming back to a status quo ante and negotiate uh, the Constitution? We have always said that the Constitution can be modified, for course. You can hear me? Okay. Uh, I have always said that the Constitution can be modified, of course, because change, society is changing. Uh, the, the, the situations change step by step. But if we have to modify the Constitution, it has be because there is no chantage. There is no, th there is, you don't have to change it because somebody is telling you that if you don't change it, something will happen. We will have to change if we have a big commons definitions. If we want to do it together because everybody has to improve 
because of the change. Not because only a small part of the society, a small party, small group get involved in some very for only for them. What will happen in the future? I actually don't know. But if we are in the democracy and we want to rule with democracy, we have to keep the rules. What you can say is, I don't like these rules by myself. I wish I will change it. As, ah, I have tried, but I don't want to pass through what, if you don't pass, if you keep the, the, the law, will happen. This is unresponsible. We always know what we had to do when we drive a car, except in Britain, that they drive on the left. We know what is uh, the red light. We know when we drive and we are on the green line, we can drive through. But it is red, you can pass through. But if somebody that has said that they don't like the red light, to be stop him. Maybe you can change it, but let's decide it together. What you can do is say that you don't like these rules that have been approved, that have been passed by all the Spanish people in 1978 together. Do we have to change it? Maybe. But let's think, why do we have to change the rules? Why do we have to change the Constitution? For example, it's an obvious thing that for us, for the monarchies, is not has any sense that only the male uh, pr uh, prince get in the possibility to be king. We have to change this. It's obvious, common sense. But let's think what affect all of us. And uh, what uh, Yusuf Kuni has said that is an interesting thing. Uh, I don't know what will happen, but uh, it's important to think what will happen in the future. Mm -hmm. Everything that will happen in the future has to be done by the law, by the approved law. This is democracy. Democracy is to keep the law, even if you don't like it. Do you want to, th to change laws? get to the parliament and change it. But only when you are in the parliament, not because you like the law you are in. Because if it's everybody do that. I take that point. I take, oh, I take that point, thin. but the one point I would make in the talk just quickly is, when there was a political agreement, that was a democratic agreement between central government and regional government, the constitutional court struck it down. The democratic option was for people to say, right, if they, if they believe that that is something that under the present constitutional arrangements is problematic, you would have a referendum and say, right, we will now put in an agreed way, because we've agreed this politically, we will put a constitutional amendment to all of Spain that we put, that this p political arrangement that we put in place will now be validated. In other words, that would be, was the way to go, in my opinion, because you'd be able to say, and I would say as a citizen, if the, if the court have taken that position, we can change the constitution to facilitate this political agreement, and we wouldn't be in the position we're in today. But if we do so that, that was an option that wasn't taken. Yes, uh, but if we do that, everybody could do that. Yes. Every time, everywhere. No, 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 no. not every time, no. everywhere. It was a solemn agreement between central and, and, and local government that a non-elected body, the judiciary, decided to strike down. They're entitled to do that. That's their job. But arising out of that, it is open to the politicians and parliament to sit down and say, OK, we will now, obviously, we have to make this in compliance with the Constitution. If it requires a constitutional amendment, put it to the people. And if the people say, yes, we are prepared to change the Constitution to facilitate this political agreement, that would have facilitated the, uh, the, the further devolution. And maybe the independent surge would never have come because that would have satisfied the democratic wishes of the people. Yes, but you have to prove with the majority of the citizens and the majority of the parties. 
Not only, but it's more Mr. Mr. Roman, I only ask the question because I don't know it. Uh, in Germany, we have a quorum, a quorum yeah. which is needed to, uh, to change the constitution. If the quorum is not, uh, um, if you don't get the quorum, there's no way to change the constitution. I think you will have uh, something SP. similar. The same so, um, so it depends. Uh, I, I've been a member of parliament nearly 16 years. And uh, you have much more experience, I know. But I remember when the political will decides to change something and uh, the law is against it, even the, the constitutional law, the politician have to change the constitution. And if they get the quorum, yes. it's done. It's and done. sometimes it only depends on the good idea. Um, I, I, I take your, um, uh, your lightning, uh, your, your light, the yes. red light. After the reunification of East and West Germany, uh, we had to bring different countries together. And in East Germany, there was a green arrow beside the red light. And that meant uh, at several crossings, even if the, right is uh, the light is red, and you see there's no car passing, you can take the green arrow and um, cross the street. So sometimes it's only, only, well. only the will to find a solution. I understand it, but you have to, 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 to hear the majority. You have, for example, in Spain, you have three of the five parts of the, of the chamber. If it's go, let's yeah. change it. But if it's, it is possible... We need two-thirds of both chambers. Yes, yes. But, but in Spain, we don't have it. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry, um, only for, for mention I'm before. To to you. Um, number one, the law can be changed. Is that right? Yes, for Number sure. two, we have a problem with law because there are a different groups of lawyers, of doctors, who has a different meaning about the same law. Is that right? Yes. And number three, it depends the way you use to change the law. Obviously, you can, you can find the solution or the possible solution. It depends the voluntary, Absolutely. the political voluntary. And I think so, in Spain, for a long, long time, the, politi the political voluntary was disappeared. And that's one of the main problems we uh, have in front of us just now. If you don't find a solution for this point, the general solution for the Catalan problem that will don't arrive never, I think so. I think it's obvious that the independence parties um, made a lot of mistakes, made a lot of um, lies, made a lot of uh, errors. But it's also true, the political party, special Popular Party during the five years in the central government thought the Catalan problem was like a bird that one day passed just in front of us and maybe tomorrow will be disappear. And it's not true. The Catalan problem is here and the Catalan problem came to rest here for a long, long time. But Mr. Cooney, is, isn't it better, I uh, want to involve Mr. Maas, if I may. Of course. <laughs> is, uh, isn't it better to, to start ag again and don't look into the history? Um, you have to know the history because everything is coming out of it, but uh, to get a solution for the future, you should start now once again. And uh, isn't it um, necessary to find political leaders which have trust to each other, that they can Michael Gorbachev and Helmut Kohl went together into the sauna, naked. I don't want to think longer about it, but um, uh, they, they, had, they, had, uh, they had common experiences. They had common experiences which created trust. And on the basis of this trust, they took the leadership to change the things. Could this be a way? It was a way at the time, and it can always be a way. I remember when uh, I was head of the opposition in the Catalan parliament in 2005, 2006, and uh, I personally 
dealt with Mr. Rodriguez Zapatero, at that time uh, the Spanish Prime Minister representing the Socialist Party. We uh, held uh, several meetings, and in the end, we reached an agreement. And that agreement, as uh, the uh, former Prime Min uh, Irish Prime Minister said, this agreement was transformed into a law after a negotiation between the Catalan Parliament and the Spanish Parliament, both chambers of the Spanish Parliament, the what we call Congreso de los Diputados, the Chamber of uh, the House of Representatives, and the Senate. And uh, we got an absolute majority in both chambers in Madrid. And the project of uh, the Catalan Home Rule uh, turned into a Spanish law, approved by the Parliament. <coughs> but in order to come in force, it was obliged by the Spanish law that a referendum in Catalonia took place. And it was a binding referendum. If Catalan people would have said no, then, because they have the last say according to the Spanish regulations, the Statute of Autonomy of Catalonia wouldn't have come into force. So the referendum was held in 2006, in June 2006, 74% of the Catalan people voted for the uh, Home Rule. And four years after that, because there was uh, an appeal from uh, the Popular Party at that time in the opposition in Madrid, and probably the main goal of the Popular Party at the time was to win the elections and to fire the socialist government from uh, Madrid, they appealed the Constitutional Court. And after an awful public discussion between the members of the Constitutional Court, they struck down the main articles of the home, Catalan Home Rule that had been previously voted uh, via a binding referendum. So, my conclusion. Uh, Mr. Cohen, as you said, if in Spain we had had politicians like the former Irish Prime Minister, in few weeks at that time we could have reached an agreement. Because what he said very wisely, very smartly, is that when you make a mistake, you have the opportunity to uh, find a solution if you accept that that was a mistake. And if the Statute of Autonomy of uh, Catalonia was uh, not able to be uh, included in the uh, Spanish Constitution, then change the Constitution to accept the last say of people according to the rules, to the rule of law. That would have been the wise position. That would have been the useful position. But uh, instead of uh, this reaction, what we found was the uh, feeling of we have won. So we, you won't have your uh, uh, home rule. You have to accept that this is just the way it is. And let me uh, uh, tell you that uh, we account for, in Catalonia, we account for 16% of the Spanish population. How 16% of the population can change the constitution if there is not the will of the broad Spanish man, uh, uh, political parties to do so? So, the solution was there, the solution is still there, but we need the political will to find solutions, not to invent crimes, not to accuse people of rebellion with violence, when everybody knows that, that there was no violence in Catalonia. Even the German courts have uh, realized that there was no violence. 
And this is why Mr. Puigdemont is in Belgium instead of uh, in uh, Madrid in prison. And let me say uh, maybe another important thing, in my opinion. Uh, we uh, defend the rule of law. We defend the rule of law. But it is not the same thing, the rule of law, than the rule by law. It is not the same thing. And the lawyers know that. And in Spain, now, there is no the, 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 the rule of law. There is the rule by law. And this is why we are suffering the unfair consequences of all that process. Are there, <coughs> are, there not, are there not enough checks and balances in Spain? Or is your party really working uh, with the motto, the winner takes it all? Let's see. Uh, maybe you don't know, but President Artur Mas and me, we are very good friends we, from a long time ago. We have a very good personal relationship, but we are quite different in position. <laughs> and, and I accept that you wanted to kick yeah. out the Social Democrats no, out of the government. No, no, let's see, okay. let's see. No. What Popular Party is saying is not only no, saying... No, no. It's not only said by the Popular Party. They are Socialist Party, it is uh, Ciudadanos, another you know, party in Spain, that we are nowadays in the same line. I repeat, when we in the Senate prove, pass, the 155 article is because we mostly think of that. It's obviously that laws can be changed, for sure, because law has to solve different problems that appear on time, in different times, in different years. But when you want to change something, you have to have the common agreement of the majority. Because President Mayer has said, you in Catalonia was the 65% representation, and you have the, the support of of the other parties, okay? Because all thought in the same way, but sometimes it's not in the same way. We in Spain, our main problem nowadays in Spain is the situation in Catalonia. Not with the Catalans, only with the decisions of the politicians that are managing the Catalan government. That is quite different. And if we want to solve something, we have to do it together. <coughs> and maybe we need sometimes more time than we thought in the first time. Let's sit and talk about what is common with mostly of the population of the citizen of Spain. The decision to, to, to go to a referendum is the decision of a country, not of a region. This is what the Constitution said. The Spanish Constitution said that we can go for a uh, referendum if the Spanish law passed on this way. But it's impossible because the law doesn't allow it that the referendum is only done by a portion, a region of Spain. Because Catalonia is from all the Spaniards. Because we felt. The same love from Catalonia, not as, maybe, as bigger than the Catalonians, but not less. Because what is happening, um, you can loud, maybe, but I am speaking seriously. What is happening in Spain affects all the Spaniards. And we have to have a big sensibility, not to think in, in ourselves, but think in the whole. It's it's a goal for all of us. It's a problem that I'm afraid we won't solve in very few time, time. But we need to solve it. Do we have to change something? Let's do it. But oh no, not only the popular party, the Socialist Party, Ciudadanos, and other parties. Because if we need three, three parts of five, it's three parts of five. Do we have to change it? Let's change it together. I mean, dialogue is always positive. Thinking in positive 
is what we had to do. Now let's do it together. Not only a small piece of Spain and Catalonia is absolutely loved by all the Spaniards. Thank you, Mr. Be before Mr. Marx can respond, um, <clears throat> only one point. Um, I remember from my time in office as a federal minister of Germany that in governmental affairs you have to negotiate with the politicians which are on the stage. Uh, sometimes I would create my own politicians for negotiations, it would be wonderful, but at the end of the day you have to take, t take it or leave it. And um, as far as I remember, the Catalonian citizen elected the Catalonian government, so it does not work. If, you, if, if, if somebody don't want to talk to the existing government because uh, you say the people think different like the government does, mm -hmm. uh, as long as they have a majority in, in, in public elections, uh, you have to take the government. And I had, in my time in office, I had governments never have been elected. Yeah, I, had to, I had to talk to, to governments uh, where you don't want to know how they come from sometimes. And um, I think coming back to the, to, the, to the bottom of the discussion, mm -hmm. coming back to trust and to the maybe influence of di uh, cultural diplomacy with the new office uh, in Catalonia, could this be a basis to, to find a common, a, a common ground to start again? Mm -hmm. Together. Together, yes. Together. Together. It is, um, it is true that uh, the Spanish Constitution states that uh, the referendum is uh, something that uh, the Spanish government has to, uh, has to approve. Uh, this is true. But, and this is why two-thirds of the Catalan Parliament in 2014 went to the Spanish Parliament, the MPs, and asked for the transfer of this, uh, of this, uh, of this tool. Uh, so at the beginning, the idea of uh, the Catalan Parliament was not to take uh, unilateral decisions or to organize a referendum itself without an agreement with the central government and the Spanish Parliament. This is why two thirds of the Catalan Parliament, a broad majority, went to Madrid to ask for the transfer of uh, this uh, power. The answer of uh, the Spanish Parliament was uh, no, that's clear. But then there was another solution. Nobody impedes uh, the, um, the uh, Spanish government to hold the referendum. This is their power. So use it. That would have been another solution. If the Spanish government uh, if the Spanish government had decided to hold a referendum on the political future of Catalonia or in the Constitution or something similar, then nobody could have, uh, could have uh, impede this uh, uh, initiative, from, this legal initiative from uh, the central government. But again, the problem is that uh, instead of uh, taking steps uh, on the political field, they decided to go to courts under the penal code. And uh, it is absolutely impossible to find a solution, a, a political solution, if uh, your position is that this is a judicial issue. Uh, well, the uh, current situation is uh, the one uh, we have on the table, that's clear. So uh, the trial will start in uh, some weeks. Uh, we will see the consequences of uh, this trial. I don't think that these consequences can be positive, but uh, this is something that uh, we have to uh, check in the, next, uh, in the next few months. And uh, in my opinion, um, if there is a solution to free the uh, politicians that are uh, behind bars, and to uh, let the other politicians that are in exile to come back to uh, the country, if this is possible, then uh, we, have to, uh, we have to start again. Uh, we have to start a big again uh, with, a, with a real dialogue, but the first step for a real dialogue is to 
uh, accept the reality you have. If you don't accept the reality, you're not going to solve the problem. Once you have accepted the reality, then you have several solutions on the table. And I think that if uh, we are Democrats and uh, we understand that uh, the majority of the people want to have the last say on these very uh, relevant issues, then the only condition is that the final step uh, has to be uh, a direct consultation to the people. And it's not so difficult to do so, but you have to uh, accept that the reality has changed and that right now there is after elections called by the central government in Madrid under imposed uh, direct rule, there is an absolute majority in the Catalan parliament not in favor of a referendum, in favor of independence. When the British realized that in Scotland there was an absolute majority in the Scottish Parliament in favor of a referendum, what uh, did they do? They didn't uh, go to courts. They didn't apply the penal code. They understood that democracy obliged them to talk, at least to talk, and to recognize the reality after the elections in Scotland. And after the conversations, they were, uh, uh, they were um, clever enough to reach an agreement, probably not the agreement that the Scottish government would, uh, um, would have wanted, but they reached an agreement. So it is not impossible. But even if Mr. Gunnarsson will prosecute me for being guilty running out of time, uh, you have the opportunity, before I open up the floor for the um, audience, um, okay. please. I don't know much about this uh, situation in Spain, fortunately. But I have one or two questions. First, uh, this referendum was not according to law or the constitution, okay? Is that right? And if not, it, adds, it, it wouldn't have any legal binding effect afterwards. So why did the Spanish government send in troops to stop it? <laughs> and did it uh, result in more, uh, more uh, people uh, following on this, uh, this uh, independence uh, battle? No. Uh, so if, we, if you have a refer referendum, which is not a referendum, <coughs> just a poll, and you have a probably, uh, maybe, I don't know, as I see it, it's possible you would have not reached 50% then. Is it possible? Then it would, would have been a stronger case for Spain just to let you do this referendum which had no legal binding. Do you understand where I'm going with this? I think I understand exactly. that you opened up another round um, <laughs> before we yeah. go to the audience. I have to say, you have listened to these fine politicians, and this is why I didn't go to politics. <laughs> I, if, I am, if I am in the uh, Supreme Court, I get a half an hour, 15 minutes, so I'm short. Thank you. Will you respond? Okay, um, we could get it. Um, I, th I think in, in my understanding, there was uh, opportunity for a referendum in 2006. Then in between the constitution was changed? No, 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 on the Home Rule. That had been agreed in Madrid in both chambers by an absolute majority. That was the case, but because it was obliged, according to the Spanish law, to hold a, ref uh, to hold a binding referendum, and we did so. I was not president at that time. Mr. Montilla, who uh, spoke, uh, I think, uh, a few hours ago, was the president of uh, of um, of the uh, well, mm, no, Mr. Maragall was uh, the former uh, mayor of Barcelona was the president of the Catalan government, and uh, and the referendum took place, but it was compulsory from uh, the legal point of view, and without 
uh, the affirmative uh, without the yes vote. I'm in talking about the referendum in 2007. 2017. Ah, yeah. 2000, well, well, then there was the, the troop was sent in and there were some problems. Yeah, of I course, of course. What have, would have been the consequences of that referendum if it had been left and you could have finished the well, referendum? Well, it, w so uh, it, it would have... Any yes, legal yes, okay. Effect? okay, it would have depended yeah. upon the majority in favor or against independence. Or imagine, and that uh, would have could have been another solution. Imagine that uh, the uh, Spanish political forces would have said, okay, we agree on the idea of the referendum, but, but we have to, uh, ag to also agree on the terms of the referendum. And uh, we, Spanish political forces, have a specific political proposal for the Catalan self-government. And we want that this new proposal uh, can be voted directly by Catalan population. Well, that would be also accepted. That would be also accepted, but there is no Spanish proposal. There is a Catalan proposal on the table, but there is no Spanish proposal. And the, also, the only solution is not to talk about this, because I don't like this, so I don't talk about the issue. And if you uh, if you uh, fulfill uh, the mandate of the people after the elections, you Catalan politicians will be uh, will be tried under the penal code and probably sent to prison. Well, this is the situation. Uh, Mr. Cuny said before the uh, Catalan uh, pro-independent uh, uh, parties have made uh, a lot of mistakes. Maybe, uh, you are, maybe you are right. But yes, maybe you are right. But, uh, but it is not a mistake, in my view, it is not a mistake to try to solve a political problem from a uh, political uh, negotiation. And it is a huge mistake to try to solve a democratic issue through the p uh, under the penal code. Thank you, Mr. Mas. One sentence from Mr. Raman, yes, to be fair, very, yes. and then I no, open no. up to the audience. It's all the uh, curiosity is that the data. What I'm going to say is the data. Do you know that in that referendum, and it's the data, you can check it, one people could vote in three or four different tables? Yeah. Do you know that? Okay. This is true. It is published by journalists with cameras. <laughs> no, it's true. Uh, do you know not everybody could vote in that referendum? Because n only, not, all, not all the whole people receive the possibility for voting, and it's a data. But if you want, you give me my email, I will send to you the video of some journalists who vote in three or four different tables. You didn't know that. Thank you. Now, we are out of time, and your tapas are running away. I don't know. Um, I open up uh, for the audience for three questions, and please, questions, and tell to whom you bring the questions in the debate. Yes, please. Yes. Hello. Uh, referring to data, my name is Martínez Rey. I'm the executive director of Catalonia Green Investment. I am not going to comment on the political positions of uh, Mr. Boza, but referring to data, uh, I will refer to the companies that ran away from Catalonia in 2017. Actually, you said it was well above 4,000 companies. Actually, 3,700 companies moved their seat from Catalonia to somewhere else in Spain in 2017. But at the same time, 9,385 companies were created in Catalonia. Their seed was either created within Catalonia or from foreign direct investments. Companies were created in Catalonia. This clearly offsets the <coughs> companies running away from Spain. All the more so if you see that 660 companies in 2017 moved their seed away from somewhere else in Spain 
to Catalonia. So actually, if we talk about data, you need, you need to broaden the picture. I, I know that data, you, you, you know. Well, I know the data. Yes, yes, so, <laughs> yes. Uh, let's see, uh, in each region, so many companies and enterprises are created daily by entrepreneurs, by many, many different ways. If you see the names of the almost 4,000 companies that is going away from Catalonia, there are no simple companies. They're the reference of the international companies, national companies. I, I, it's data, as you can see. Can you please tell me how many German companies moved away from Catalonia in 2017? No, I don't have this data. No. No, no, here I don't have it. But anyway, you can, you can, eat your data. I, I, I can contrast them. But it's a fact, it's a fact that. I don't know how facts No, 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 it's a fact. No, it's a fact. You have the data. No, I don't have it. But if you made me, I would give <laughs> another data. But the main important thing is that it's a fact that the main important companies that were Coca Cola. Is, is based in, 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 in Barcelona. It's not in Madrid. You mean? But, it's no, it's a, it's it's but anyway, 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 there are important companies that is going away from Barcelona, but it's data. Is that you have an, one data, you have, I have another one, but it's, it's a fact. I don't, I don't see by myself. You can, any of you can see and read the newspaper and you, you can, you can see what, how important are these companies. But, but anyway, um, I think uh, it's clear for everybody of us that some companies ha have been concerned about the situation. Please. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, with the European election coming up uh, soon next year, yeah. I don't think your lives, and I'm talking to both sides, will become any easier. How would you give the prospect? To whom do you ask? Uh, to, to both political. To, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. But, uh, I would welcome reactions no, from no, everybody, no, no, actually. No. But this would be interesting. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out where the British understand. Said, two political kind of sides, yeah. uh, not even parties. Because uh, it, is a, it is an important kind of test, uh, the European election. I know that that is a big issue in my country from the point of view that it does affect domestic uh, processes and domestic. Uh, um, uh, relationships, political relationships. So how will that affect? Uh, I don't think that will bring about any easy solution or any uh, uh, kind of fast solution <coughs> with regard to the domestic, whatever. It's not a domestic issue, I agree, it has gone beyond. So Europe, European Union, European elections in the whole complicated picture which you just described. Mm -hmm. Mr. Puigdemont is living in the European capital. Would you like to start? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, you know that, uh, like uh, everywhere, the uh, turnout in uh, European elections is uh, the smallest one, the lowest one. Well, that's uh, a pity in my opinion, but uh, it is also a sign of uh, a deeper uh, problem. Uh, in Spain, uh, when uh, European elections are held, uh, there is, uh, I don't know the expression in, uh, in English, but there is only one, what we call uh, uh, circumscription, so it's a constituency. Uh, constituency, that's right. There is only one constituency for the whole country. Yeah, like in Germany. Like in Germany. Uh, so, um, uh, Generally, well, uh, traditionally, what uh, we did, the uh, let's say the the the, 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 the regional uh, political parties, is to uh, form coalitions between uh, various political parties representing uh, various uh, regions or uh, territories. And uh, because uh, we did that in the past, we obtained uh, uh, every, every, every uh, in every uh, European elections, we had, we obtained a direct representation okay. in the uh, in the in the uh, European Parliament, and this is the case right now. 
This is exactly the case right now. In my opinion, uh, in this specific, uh, in this specific, uh, in, in the, the specific situation we have right now in Catalonia, it would be better for the political parties in favor of uh, the right to decide, independence, and so on, it would be better to form a uh, sole electoral list in order to have the, uh, in order to uh, obtain a very good electoral uh, result. And that good electoral result could be seen from the rest of Europe as a uh, victory of those political parties. But I'm not 100% sure that this uh, purpose could, that, that, this, uh, uh, that this objective can be uh, achieved. But it's still possible because the CSU in Bavaria does it every time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think the, this, uh, this much is played in the, in the local um, uh, issue because, for example, the, 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 the constitutionalism, constitutionalism parties uh, are mostly are European parties, mostly. Social Party, Popular Party, uh, Ciudadanos, that are the main forces, uh, representative and in the, in the, in the courts. But I think when people vote for European uh, elections, they don't think in Catalonia, because uh, Catalonia is, is, another, is another situation, is a different one. I think when we have, because this day in Spain, we have local elections, regional elections and uh, European elections, then it's quite difficult, this situation. I have been mayor from my city for, uh, for eight years. And you know, in, in all the cities, people vote for the mayor, the person, the person not the party. And we can find uh, uh, a big uh, result for a person because people love and want this person to manage their, uh, their interests and change in another person for the local, regional government, and in fact, in the European one. But it has been so said, we, we have only one whole mm -hmm. election. Yeah. I think people won't, will vote for the European elections, won't think about, in general, yeah. mm -hmm. won't think about the, the Catalonian yeah, situation. situation uh, yes. be yeah. Before you get the opportunity for the last question, um, <coughs> I, I would like to hear from Mr. Cohn. What will it mean for you when your citizens are allowed to vote at the European elections and your neighbors in Northern Ireland are not allowed anymore? Uh -huh. yeah. it's, it's a different issue, I know, yeah, but it's, it's, it's very interesting. interesting for me, I guess. Yeah, I mean, th it's true that, you see, <laughs> back, to the, back to our problem again, I mean, Northern Ireland voted to stay in the European Union. Um, Scotland voted to stay in the European Union. Wales, who get more money from regional funds than any other part of Great Britain, wanted to go out, wanted to go out so they can't count. And Britain uh, wants to leave. And uh, so, and they added it all up and they said, okay, we're leaving. And the Brexiteers, of course, say the Irish backstop, uh, get rid of it. Um, that part of the United Kingdom is as much a part of the United Kingdom as London, of course. I often say to them, if you, if you think that, why don't you come and visit us sometime? <laughs> Have a look around. <laughs> They've never been in Northern Ireland. They don't care about Northern Ireland. But they, they hold up to the unionists because the unionists, of course, give them some votes to stay in government. Mm. So. so when I hear that, Mrs. Thatcher say that, Northern Ireland is as much a part of uh, Britain as Finchley. Finchley was her constituency. And I said to her, come, come join us. Come have a, come have a look and see if you see any part of Ireland that's Finchley. <laughs> crazy, crazy people. But anyway, point is, to answer your question, we're going to have a situation where despite the fact that the people of Northern Ireland, including the unionists, because the DUP who are supporting the um, Conservative government, Mrs. May, are a Eurosceptic party, they don't even represent the majority of unionist opinion in relation to the European mm -hmm. question. 
But anyway, they will not have any vote. They will have no representation in the European Union or in the European Parliament, the same as every other part of the United Kingdom. But we look forward to representing their interests, as we've always done. And we've always had good cooperation with them. For example, on common agricultural policy. Mm -hmm. You know, we have, we have, uh, that's why we can't have a border. We can't have a hard border because all of these people are coming and going across that border every day of the week. Our dairy industry is integrated. You know, our cattle cross across the border. Never mind the people. So, yeah, so, so it's a, it's a, it's not a good situation. And that's why the backstop is so important. Because if they have their way and you set up a, set up a hard border, which would have to be the case if they go without any plan. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we spent all our political lifetimes making sure we didn't have customs posts. The first people to die in the northern conflict occupied a customs post. Yeah. Yeah. If you set those up again, you have dissidents yep. mm -hmm. who will try and start this again. So That's how important it is. It's a matter of life and death for us. For them over the, in Britain, it's, they think it's, don't worry about it, it's not our problem. It so will be a big problem for them if it happens. We, we learn that territorial issues are not every time without political uh, Of course. Dangerous. And they forget about the fact that they signed <coughs> the Good Friday Agreement, the peace agreement in 1998, which is of <coughs> treaty status and binds successive Irish governments and successive British governments. And there are very con complex constitutional concepts in that agreement. For example, do you know that in Northern Ireland, regardless of your affiliation, whether you're a unionist or a nationalist, you can be a British citizen in Northern Ireland. You can be an Irish citizen in Northern Ireland. You can be a British and an Irish citizen in Northern Ireland. And yet they say it's the same as Finchley. <laughs> and they have signed this agreement 25 years ago. They haven't read it in 25 years, obviously, because they don't know what's in it. And this is what we have to put up with all the time. This, uh, you know, they've got to understand that we are committed to peaceful progression. We await the consent of the people of Northern Ireland before we ever have a united Ireland. We don't knock on the door looking for it today, tomorrow, or maybe even, even in my lifetime. But if they don't understand that it's a different part, that that Northern Ireland is different to every other part of the United Kingdom, they don't even know their own history. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Mrs. Capritz? Uh, from the uh, Catalan representation as one of our hosts today has the right of the last question. Thank you very much. Um, my question is to Mr. Gunnar Mag Magnusson Gunna from Iceland. Um, I'm not very familiar with the situation of Iceland, but I'm, well, we are, I think we are well informed that Iceland underwent a deep crisis in the recent years of um, financial crisis and its effect on the Iceland, island. And um, I imagine the island also, the government underwent of the whole system underwent also a, a range of, um, of um, uh, reforms and that would have affected also the, the laws of uh, Iceland. So my question to you is how do you assure in Iceland um, as your experience, um, they, they, that legal, the legal system matches with the legitimacy. What people need and want is what the, the law reflects. I'm not sure I understand the question, but uh, we have tightened the uh, lower grant of banks. They were the main cause of this fiasco. And they are just one tenth of what they were before. As you probably know, we divided them into good and bad bank, and they are near to what we need today. And and highly highly regulated, and they have their their own capital is higher than before. Uh, yeah, Iceland uh, had a really bad time. It was not looking good in 2008 and 9, but now it's we are paying down our debts. We are. Uh, the tourist <coughs> industry has uh, bloomed. It has, uh, it has uh, grown uh, like 30% a year from 2010 to 2017. So, yeah, we are back in track. Uh, there is uh, the main uh, casualty of those, all of those, 
is that we have a political uh, meltdown and if you ask me I'm a lawyer not a politician and not a diplomat uh, we have I ask you for the laws the legitimacy of the laws and the law enforcement and the reforms the necessary reforms how do you mesh that with the the, the democratic participation processes so people can uh, they feel represented by their laws and I don't understand what you're <laughs> okay okay it, it has been in one or minor, minority of the, of the political parties some <coughs> talk about renewing the constitution totally we are working on slight changes it was a misunderstanding I think with many people that the constitution was behind the bank fiasco. Mm -hmm. And politically it's, it's a minority I think now some which, which um, fights for changing the constitution. And it's like in Iceland, it's always, we have had some catastrophes regularly. The cut goes away, we have a volcanic eruption, we have a bank fiasco <laughs> or something and then we get in the saddle again and we start again. And we are in a good place now and people are <laughs> have started traveling to Catalonia and <laughs> bathing the sun and the bodies are gone mostly. But we are still, uh, yeah, but we have a little bit damaged political so, uh, system. Thank you very much. Thanks to all the panelists. Unfortunately, we are half an hour out of the time, but please, an applause for you. I think, I think we knew in the, beginning, in the beginning that we won't find a solution today, but uh, staying in contact and talk together may be the first step. Thank you very much. Okay.